Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. And now that the curator's sitting in the front row, I really got to get started here. Um, I can't tell you how nice it is to see everybody um, live and in person and not on Zoom. I mean, it's, it's, I could just stand here all day, but I know that's not what you want to do. And I'm going to keep my mark, remarks relatively short because it is an extraordinary show. It is rich in materials. There's a lot to see, a lot to experience. And even for those of you who are um, very knowledgeable about Hopper, you're going to be um, learning and seeing a lot of things. I mean, I've spent a better part of my career around all of the Hoppers here at New York and, and here at the Whitney. And I have to say, um, going through the show, I feel like I have learned so much in the process of this. Um, so uh, just begin. Yeah, come on in. For those of you standing in the back, and some of it is my staff, and those in the staff, you can actually look like you're participating. Come forward. <laughs> Great. Feel free to sit down. Okay, so um, let me just first by saying I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney, and I'm so happy to have you here this morning. We are truly honored to present Edward Hopper's New York, which is a reconsideration of the iconic artist's work and the first museum exhibition specifically examining Hopper's relationship to New York City, his home um, uh, here for uh, 63 years, I think it is. Uh, the career and work of Edward Hopper, as you all know, has been a touchstone for the Whitney even before the museum was founded officially as a museum. In 1920, he was 37 years old when he had his first solo exhibition at the Whitney Studio Club, which was the forerunner of the museum. The association was formed by Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney herself to support independent American artists working against the grain of conventional academic art, of which she was one, which I think is there even more admirable that she supported it. Hopper had eight exhibitions at the Studio Club before it closed to make way for the Whitney Museum which at the time was on A Street, which is today the um, studio school, which is not far away, so you could walk by and actually haunt o and walk over to um, uh, Washington Square North and see where Hopper lived, so um, actually, which is a nice day to do that. And um, you'll, you'll um, get a sense of the view, and actually, as we know, Washington Square even still somewhat resembles uh, what it was like in those days. In May of 1930, the Whitney became one of the first museums to acquire a Hopper work when Mrs. Whitney purchased the iconic early Sunday morning. His painting, Room in New York, was included in the first Whitney Biennial in 1932, and it's back again 90 years later here in the museum. He participated in 29 annuals and biennials, which is, I think, probably the record of all artists, but pretty, pretty darn close up until 1965, just a few years before he died. Today, the Whitney has the largest collection of Hopper's artworks and archival material, um, 3,100 works in, um, at all, um, and all together are in the Whitney's collections, which represents um, roughly about 10% of the total holdings of the Whitney Museum, which is an interesting thing. The Whitney is truly Hopper's home, and while we've explored his work many, many times before, and in my 30 years here at the museum, we've had, um, I think, six or eight major exhibitions of Hopper's work, um, this exhibition is real evidence that, in fact, this is an artist who is, whose greatness and the richness and variety of his work um, it, um, bears further exploration. Edward Hopper's New York showcases 200 artworks, both iconic and understudied, presented alongside newly acquired archival materials that provide a deeper understanding of Hopper and his process. Despite his private, solitary, hermit-like nature, Edward Hopper was a man of the city, New York City. He was an observer and what Baudelaire, one of his favorite authors, termed a flaneur, a spectator of modern life. Hopper famously and tersely wrote, Great art is the outward expression of an inner life in the artist and would result in his personal vision of the world. And as Kim Conaty, our curator who brilliantly curated this exhibition, has noted, Hopper's New York was a carefully measured synthesis of reality and fantasy. The modern was often disturbing to Hopper. As new buildings encroached on Washington Square, Hopper strongly opposed the desecration of his neighborhood. This exhibition is the story of an artist who, while capturing the soul and soullessness, soullessness of modern life, simultaneously shunned it and sought to find those moments of beauty, quietude, despite the changes that he detested. He painted the world he saw, the world he knew, 
the world he invented, and the world he wished. Over offering radical new insights in the artist, among them his ideas and activism regarding urban development and his disconnection from the social realities of his day, Edward Hopper's New York is a fascinating reconsideration of his work. And it's especially interesting through the lens of today and for a new generation of artists. And when you think about what we've just been through in the pandemic, we planned this long before the pandemic and all the changes that have happened in New York. I think this is a really great moment for us to all be coming together and celebrating a New York um, that has a reality to it, but it's also a fantasy of what we all hope and imagine it could be. I first and foremost want to thank Kim Conaty, the Whitney Stephen and Ann Ames Curator of Drawings and Prints. Thank you to Kim and Curatorial Associate Melinda Lang. Where are you, Melinda? Over there. Um, you, your research, your scholarship, the energy you put into it, um, and it was what was supposed to be, I think, a three-year process, ended up being a four-year process, um, um, which is uh, quite a devotion. And I think, and I just want to say, um, uh, there's been a long series of generations of Hopper scholars in this institution, and this institution has passed the torch from generation to generation, from Gail Levin to Barbara Haskell to Carter Foster, um, and, um, and to Kim Conaty. And, you know, this is a process of, it's a rite of passage for Whitney curators, and we're proud of all the work that is done in each layer that is added to this um, wonderful process. But I also want to thank the entire staff of the Whitney Museum, because Hopper is everybody's work in this museum. It's the registrars, the art handlers, the conservators, the editors, designers, exhibition designers, educators, security department, advanced visitors, sta services staff. They say it takes a, a, a village. In our case, it takes a city, New York City. Um, I have to thank and would like to thank our magnanimous supporters. Bank of America is one of the great supporters of, of American um, art and the presentation of American art. Thank you to our dear friends from Bank of America. They supported so much, not just at the Whitney, but at the Met and the Modern and so many other museums across New York City. I want to thank Pamela Rowland, Delta Airlines, and Phillips. I would like to acknowledge our trustees, Judy Hart Angelo, Ken Griffin, the Terra Foundation for American Art, who was always supportive of great American programs, the Barbara Haskell American Fellows Legacy Fund, which I also call the Barbara Haskell Fan Club, who are great supporters of American modern art, the Brown Foundation of Houston, the David Geffen Foundation, and our trustee, Lori Tisch. The Federal Council on the Arts and Humanities is still there for us, and we hope they were there for um, continue for years to come. Um, and I also want to thank um, the many um, uh, collectors and institutional lenders um, from across the country who have su who've supported this effort. Um, we go to them again and again for the support of our Hopper shows, and I have to say they really showed up this time, and it was an important move, and um, thank you for many of you here. And last but not least, to the Wyeth Foundation for American Art for supporting um, uh, the catalog. Andrew Wyeth was always a huge fan of Hopper's work, so that's a nice touch. And our friends at New York Magazine, who has continued to be our great supporter as our exclusive media sponsor for this exhibition. So without further ado, Kim Conaty. Thank you, and congratulations, Kim. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm Kim Conaty, the Stephen and Ann Ames Curator of Drawings and Prints, and I'm one of the lucky ones who's had the opportunity to be immersed in the work of Edward Hopper for nearly four years. We're so thrilled to share this show with you here, downtown at the Whitney, for there is truly no better place to experience this group of works that were largely created only blocks south of the museum today and that connect us, often in unexpected ways, with the past and present of our city. I wanna start by setting the scene. And here we are on Hopper's rooftop in Washington Square, in one of these rare and quite beautiful watercolors he made in the city. Hopper lived in New York in the same fourth floor walk up in Washington Square for nearly six decades, and this exhibition, as Adam mentioned, believe it or not, is the first Hopper exhibition that looks at his life and work in relation to the city. That lens has allowed for many insights and discoveries, 
very much thinking about Hopper as a human being living in this city and who really knew this city more than the landmarks or decorated facades, and in fact, with much greater interest in the abstraction and fantastical compositions created by its infrastructure. Hopper famously detested skyscrapers and the increasing verticality of the city, so I like to think of this composition as the closest he ever got to a skyscraper village. Importantly, this is Hopper's New York, and it's a highly personal view of the city. And here you have Hopper's self-portrait in the Whitney's collection and a wonderful photographic portrait by George Platt Lines, now in our archives, where we see him in his Washington Square studio, looking out over, well, I guess in the background, um, seeing Judson Memorial Church, one of the few buildings around the square that remained unchanged during his time there. And this is a good segue for a quick refresher about the Whitney's holdings around Hopper, which Adam mentioned earlier. And as you can see, the holdings are rather staggering. The Whitney holds the largest concentration of Hopper's works in the world at over 3,100 works and has a long exhibition history with Hopper, as Adam mentioned, beginning with the Whitney Studio Club. The most recent exhibition at the Whitney was Hopper Drawing in 2013, which was organized by my former colleague, Carter Foster, at the Breuer Building. In 2017, the Whitney acquired the Sanborn Hopper Archive, a fascinating trove of personal materials from photographs like the one on the right to notebooks, correspondence, and ticket stubs that allow us to round out a presentation on this iconic yet elusive artist. These archival materials are being debuted in the exhibition and accompanying, colleague, uh, accompanying catalog. Many thanks to our director of research resources, Ferris Wabe, and his team for enabling us to do so much work around these materials. It was a huge effort to process these materials, ready them for presentation in the show, and prepare them to be available to researchers next week. I hope you'll enjoy these materials as much as we have. Hopper's New York will be the first major Hopper exhibition organized in the Whitney's new building. And we wanted to think a lot about place, both the experience of moving around the city and also our specific location downtown, so close to Hopper's home and studio. And so here I'm showing you a loose floor plan that will make more sense when you're in the galleries, but just to kind of give an aerial perspective. Um, we've organized the exhibition into eight sections, which is played out through a very open floor plan, punctuated by pavilions, which you see here shaded in blue. These pavilions offer deep dives into focused topics, and the concept was really to create a sense of exploration rather than a scripted path, to forge connections from ho between Hopper's work across thematics and across decades, and also hopefully to emulate the feeling of walking through a city, peering around a corner, stepping inside an interior, and emerging once again. This was a challenging plan to prepare, and I want to offer big thanks to our exhibition design team, as well as our registration and conservation teams, especially Jared Huggins, Reagan Duplisi, and Matt Skopek. So I'm now gonna move quickly through the galleries to give you a sense of what you'll see or that you may have already seen if you started upstairs. Um, at the entrance to the show, we start with the mid-career work, which seeks to really bring viewers both back in time and also into the experience of being in a city in ways that still resonate today. You'll note that hanging over the entry of the, exhi of the exhibition is a film. Um, Hopper was not a filmmaker, it's not his work. Um, rather, it's a documentary film that captures the experience of riding one of the elevated trains in New York, which Hopper loved so much, and that I think when we imagine that, vo that mode of passage through the city, there's a new way that we can look at some of, the, some of his um, compositions. The show is not a retrospective since it doesn't include works from Maine, Cape Cod, or Hopper's other locations of interest, but it does cover his entire career since New York was really part of his life since he was a child growing up in Nyack, just north of the city up the Hudson River. On the front wall of the exhibition, you'll see a wonderful selection of his first impressions, many made during his time as a commuting art student into the city 
and in his first years living here, when he lived first on West 14th Street, then East 59th Street, before settling in 1913 in Washington Square. The first focused gallery opens with a close look at Hopper's printed work, both etchings and illustrations. And this was really the work that sustained Hopper for many years before he gained notoriety, first for his watercolors and then for his paintings in the mid-1920s. Hopper's fabulous etchings remind us that his renowned mastery of light in his paintings began in black and white, as he honed his compositions of city views with illumination in deep shadows. Hopper famously dismissed his illustration work as pot boilers, but looking at the materials he preserved, now in our archive, one sees how critical some of these commissions were in the development of his later practice. The archive offers a wonderful selection of materials around Hopper's illustration career, tear sheets, covers, full issues of public trade magazines that he kept, and now allow us to study them in depth. Um, you see, for example, that um, many of the themes that he was commissioned to produce in his illustration work, such as um, for the office motif um, in publications like System Magazine, which is today's Business Week, are quite close to compositions that he came back to years later in a work like Office at Night. Um, and I want to pause here to single out one person who has been working alongside me on this project since the beginning, and that is Senior Curatorial Assistant Melinda Lang. And her steadfast support and critical intellectual contributions have made a really lasting impact on this exhibition. And you'll see a glimpse of her outstanding work on the project in her excellent essay on the illustrations in the accompanying catalog. The next major um, section of the exhibition looks at the window, which is a motif that Hopper returned to again and again. And what really, I think, interested him with windows in a city is the very sense that the public and private merge, and that it's almost something that we acknowledge in living in a major city so close to our neighbors that we, the windows both frame the view out, but also frame a view looking in. And we see this particularly in many of Hopper's um, paintings of the city at night, where you can see from a work like Drugstore, this idea of the display of goods um, is so similar to the display of private lives within. Um, we see here Hopper also playing with the idea of architecture as a stage set. Um, and one thing that I always like about thinking about compositions like Drugstore is that you know if we think about some of Hopper's work showing us this um, old view of New York, the sort of nostalgic view of New York. Um, it's, you would be hard pressed to find a pharmacy so decorated today. I think our CVSs haven't really taken that cue, but I think it's quite lovely to see like the almost jewel box atmosphere that was created really to capture people's attention and their imagination as they strolled the city at night. Um, and sort of speaking of this idea of theater, um, we have another gallery that focuses on, um, on Hopper's relationship with the theater and really how theater was both a subject, an inspiration, and a pastime for him and for his wife, the artist Josephine Nivison Hopper. Um, in this gallery, we show him um, going to different theaters around the city, um, beginning to understand their architecture, Bring, bringing all of these compositions together and creating works like New York Movie, where his wife, Josephine, served as his model, as you see here in the sketches. And then he really brings these together with sketches from four different theaters into what is ultimately a fiction of a New York movie house and a really an extraordinary composite. Um, the archival material in this gallery um, allows us to also add new insight to Hopper's experience in the city. We're displaying a number of ticket stubs that he preserved um, from all of the trips that he and Josephine took to the theater. And on each, it, he has inscribed the name of the production that he went to see. So we not only see that Hopper and Joe, famously frugal, um, loved sitting in the balcony, um, but also where they went, the theaters they visited, many of which are no longer extant, um, and the productions that they saw. And we have a wonderful um, slideshow in this gallery also that brings together production stills from specific productions that he saw, 
um, as well as images of the, the the specific theaters that he um, went to. And I want to thank our research assistant, Colton Klein, who really was the mastermind behind this, this whole um, theater presentation. Um, the next section of the exhibition looks at um, an idea that we're calling the horizontal city. Um, so if we think about a composition like Early Sunday Morning, um, I've been fascinated by the fact that Hopper painted this work in 1930, which is the same year that the Chrysler Building became the tallest building in the world, only to be beat out months later by the Empire State Building. Yet, the vertical dynamics of the growing city were of little interest to Hopper, and there's a certain irreverence here in the idea of painting a composition like Early Sunday Morning in that year, and this kind of consistent tension between a longing for the past and yet an embrace of the modern city. Um, and here, of course, we see this, the hint of what is to come from that looming gray rectangle that we have <laughs> talked so much about. Um, there's also a wonderful quote that I've thought about a lot um, from the writer Colson Whitehead when he spoke about the city and saying, you are a New Yorker when what was there before is more real and solid than what is here now. And I think that's something also that really resonates with Hopper's vision of the city. Um, in this section of the exhibition, we're bringing together five paintings that Hopper made right around 1930 that do not look this miniature in the galleries, I promise. Um, this is really more of a graphic representation to show how he painted these five paintings of these truly horizontal landscapes of the city, the exact same dimensions, this kind of panoramic view at this exact moment. Um, the section of the exhibition that looks at um, Washington Square is another one of our focus galleries and that, again, looks at um, Hopper's life in the city. And here we start with these wonderful watercolors from his rooftop, which he painted only a very few of. And also, we have this idea of really you know, bringing people into the experience of being in Hopper studio, or I should say the Hopper's studio. Um, what is, I think, really important to remember is that Hopper was not alone working in his, in his studio for all of these years, but that he shared his studio with his wife, Josephine, who had an adjacent studio in the same, in the same room. Um, and so we have a film um, in this Washington Square Gallery that is quite wonderful and that shows the two of them working together in the studio and gives a sense of their kind of work together. Um, and also this idea that, you know, reminding everyone that, that Josephine was also his, his model for all of paintings starting in the mid-1920s and also was, the, um, was really his partner in documenting his work. So we have a number of the notebooks that they kept. Um, the other exciting aspect of the Washington Square Gallery is seeing for the first time really how Hopper was perhaps what we might call a preservationist. Um, in the archive, we have a number of letters that he was writing to various city officials, including Robert Moses, as you see here, and really asking to save his building in Washington Square and to try to preserve the history of that neighborhood, to keep it as an artist's center. So there are aspects of this where he's trying to really kind of fight off gentrification um, that do certainly resonate and continue to resonate in a place like New York and in many cities. Um, but it's wonderful to kind of see Hopper in this role. And um, we've also positioned some of the, his paintings looking out over Washington Square. Um, this is a rendering, not the actual. Um, uh, right against the windows, our east-facing windows, so that you can see the paintings and also see out upon the rooftops that were similar to the rooftops that Hopper looked at himself. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, the second to last um, uh, section of the exhibition is called Reality and Fantasy. And this is really where New York begins to serve as a backdrop, I like to think, for these more evocative distillations of interior experience, where kind of interiors are really about interiority. Um, and Hopper wrote at this time about his desire to create a realistic art from which fantasy can grow. And I think this is where we see, you know, New York is dropped in almost as something to be seen out the window as just a sense of place. 
Um, and here again in compositions like Sunlight and Brownstones and Office in a Small City, where you get this again kind of stage set of New York. Um, finally, um, a wonderful gallery um, on sketching New York that brings together many of Hopper's drawings where we really see him moving around the city, returning to certain places, studying, you know, fastidiously studying the, um, the under architecture of the Maycombs Dam Bridge and all of these different sites around New York. Um, and it allows us to give a sense of process of kind of what his life was like as he was preparing for his paintings, which he only made, you know, often just two a year. So it was a, a long drawn out process. Um, this exhibition will be on view through March 5th, but I'm always grateful to give a lasting presence to an exhibition through a great exhibition catalog and Whitney editor Beth Turk and designer Kirsty Carter from A Practice for Everyday Life really delivered a book that is worth coming back to. And I'm so pleased to have many new voices to Hopper scholarship in this volume, each of whom really opened my eyes to new ways of looking at Hopper's work. And for this, I think Kirsty Bell, Darby English, the artist David Hart, and our internal authors, Melinda Lang, David Crane, Ferris Wabe, and Jenny Goldstein. And I want to conclude with um, this wonderful exchange um, with the Hoppers that we quote in the catalog. It's from an early interview with the Hoppers in their home and studio in Washington Square, in which a reporter asked them what they like to do for fun in the city. Josephine, always the more loquacious of the two, jumped in to say, we're not spectacular, and we're very private, and we don't drink, and we hardly ever smoke. Then, after a very long pause, Edward reflected, I get most of my pleasure out of the city itself. I hope you'll enjoy getting to know the city through Hopper's eyes, and thank you again for being here today. A tough act to follow. Um, Thank you, Kim. That was just fantastic. And I'm going to try everyone's patience, but just for a couple of minutes, I cannot resist having a captive audience of press people uh, to use this uh, as an opportunity to talk about some other exhibitions that are on view right now at the Whitney and that are upcoming. But first, I do want to um, say a kind of anecdote about Kim and just how remarkable this show is and that she has come to be this incredible Hopper expert. When I first met her, and was trying to lure her to come from Brandeis to work at the Whitney, she was known for working on conceptual and minimal art shows of the 1960s and 70s. And I don't think anything at that moment would have um, prepared either one of us to imagine that you would be standing here talking with such um, erudition and, and you know, clarity about Hopper. And it's such a great testament to your you know, intellectual open-mindedness and acuity and the, the fresh perspective that you brought to this material. So. Thank you for, for that. Um, we have on the same floor, adjacent to the Hopper Show, another exhibition which is opening today. I hope you'll see it. It's called In the Balance. And the curator could not be with us, Jenny Goldstein, because she actually had a baby last week. So congratulations to Jenny. Uh, two babies in one week, a show and a human baby. Uh, and this is a show that looks really very, um, in a concise way, at recent acquisitions from our collection, as well as works that haven't been seen in quite a long time uh, from our storage. And um, you can see two uh, great examples of those recent acquisitions here with Judy Chicago and Dorothea Rockburn. This exhibition really is thinking about how artists in the 1960s through the 80s were exploring a very dynamic relationship between painting and sculpture and a kind of hybrid uh, relationship among them. So I hope you'll have a chance to see that. We have just outside this door another focused exhibition uh, from our collection called Time Management Techniques that is a uh, shows artists kind of thinking about their studio practice and their daily lives in a way of marking time, of exploring um, what it means really to be in the studio from day to day, to make the photograph in relation to a sort of unfolding experiment and how to capture and think about that. We have in our lobby gallery, I hope you'll see this uh, wonderful exhibition, uh, Two Lizards, which is another recent acquisition from our collection by Orion Barkey and Miriam Benani. I think this is one of the best um, works to be made during the pandemic. And it's so hard to create um, a work of art in a particular historical moment that transcends that moment. And I feel confident that Two Lizards does that. You can see the um, 
anxiety, the interior life of these animated lizards of a work of art that was originally actually released on Instagram in episodes, sort of one after the next, uh, by artists who were dealing with their own confinement in their studios, in their personal lives, and these lizards become these kind of alter egos for them. It's really touching and beautiful and moving, and I encourage you to check it out downstairs. Um, we have things that are happening outside of the gallery, too. Uh, Rachel Rawson is our newest Artport Commission. If you don't know about Artport, please check it out on Whitney.org. This is an incredible AR piece. You can actually view it on your phone at home or on the subway or wherever you have uh, an internet connection. I really um, want to again, sort of underline our commitment to digital art at the Whitney. We have had Artport now for decades, and if you're not familiar with it, we're happy to share more about that. We have across the street, Martin Gutierrez Supremacy uh, as part of our billboard installation, or we don't call it a billboard, we call it, I don't know, a temporary art project. Uh, so it's not really advertising anything, although there has been some confusion as to whether Intermix, the store beneath this billboard, um, had something to do with Martine's incredible work. But if you squint closely at these Barbies attacking her, you will um, probably figure that it is not actually there to sell lingerie. Uh, but every uh, six months or so, we premiere a work generally with a younger or mid-career artist, uh, so make sure you see that on your way out or even from the Hopper show. And finally, three shows that we're really looking forward to over the next few months. Uh, the first is uh, No Existe on Mundo Post Huracan, which is a show marking the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Maria that will feature 20 artists from the archipelago of Puerto Rico and the diaspora. This is a very important show for the Whitney, uh, showing our commitment to Latinx artists. It is actually the first show of a major museum, not a more specialized one, but a, a bigger museum to uh, feature the work of Puerto Rican artists in more than 40 years. And we're very proud of this exhibition and uh, the many different educational community activities that we're putting together around it, um, as well as a very um, intensive bilingual program. And finally, oh no, penultimately, if that's an adverb, uh, we have Josh Klein opening at the same time. Uh, Josh is an artist who you may know from the opening of exhibition of this building or the biennial, not the most recent one, but the one before that. Uh, and he will be the next of the mid-career artists that we present um, at this building following along the lines of someone like Julie Maratu, um, Zoe Leonard, Laura Owens, where we kind of take a hard and deep look at uh, one of the artists of our day that we think uh, will hopefully stand the test of time, but has something very strong to say about the moment we're living in. And finally, uh, Jean Quick to see Smith, uh, actually a great pairing with Josh here. You have a much more senior artist um, who is dear to the Whitney and, and long a part of our collection and who will be the first ever um, indigenous artist presented at uh, the Whitney Museum in a retrospective that we organized. And for uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art to have finally reached this moment is not something I take great pride in, uh, given how, how long we've been around, but I am at the same time really thrilled to be honoring an artist who is not only um, an incredible maker of the objects that you'll see, but a champion of so many other artists uh, and her whole community through teaching, uh, through exhibition organizing, through writing, um, and is someone who I think really deserves this attention uh, and that we look forward to showcasing here. So I think that was like as fast as I could possibly go. Uh, I'm the last thing between you and some muffins or hoppers, uh, but thank you all for coming. Please do join us uh, back uh, at, at the uh, back of the room and up in the galleries and Kim will be around to answer any questions that you might have about the show. Thank you.